One second. Share. Can you guys see my screen? Nope. No. Okay. No. Well, I am going to have a problem sharing my screen, but I know Deb isn't. So I'm just going to do my intro um, and welcome everybody to Executive Director's Chat. Today's topic is artificial intelligence the good, the bad, and the scary. We started to say the ugly, but I don't think anything is ugly about artificial intelligence because we've been using it for so long and didn't know it, right? So we're gonna have this conversation um, in executive director chat. And I know uh, many of you have been here to this platform and somebody put, um, I think they put on the survey uh, about this platform. They weren't familiar with this platform. So executive director's chat is one of the platforms that we use here at TechSoup where it's the Zoom platform where we get to see your face because you always see our face during the webinars and we love seeing your face. And trust me, all our executives, they're watching, they come back and watch and they love to see your face. They love to hear what you are saying with your voice. So we want you to be a part of this conversation. So while we're having the conversation or while someone is speaking, please remain on mute. If you would like to um, make a comment or a suggestion, please use the raise your hand option at the bottom of your screen where you see the reaction button. Today, I'm excited because we have um, a guest speaker and I noticed that somebody has all already turned on the um, CC button. So I do wanna mention that if you need the closed caption, just type on that CC button. This is being recorded. So you're gonna get the recording within 48 hours, probably tomorrow. Um, if all goes well with technology, we will get this tomorrow along with the slides from today. This is a chat where we all chat together, not just Aretha chatting, not just Debbie chatting, but we are all chatting. So we would love your participation. Again, use the, um, the reaction button at the bottom, use the raise your hand option or raise your hand. I've seen people do this. So feel free to, to wave at me if um, I can't see you. So I'm gonna turn this over to Deb. She's gonna tell you more about her. She is our featured speaker today and she is one of the executive directors who was here last week. So welcome Deb. And I hope your, your um, feature is working today when you share your screen. If not, we're gonna keep rolling with it. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Deb. Well, let's see how it looks. Uh, does anybody see my screen? Yes. Aretha, do you see it? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, Aretha, thanks so much. Uh, so yes, I'm Deb Spula Gross. And uh, as Aretha said, we're not doing uh, Clint Eastwood, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're doing the good, the bad, and the scary. Um, but I do want to give fair treatment to all three. Um, so a little about me to start. Um, I have a background that's both in technology and with nonprofit organizations. Um, and I have spent time with a small, not, small uh, software company early in my career for about 15 years. So I got to see what it was like to be uh, where payroll had to be met based on the next sale, which is not unlike a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, and then I spent about 15 years in two major uh, IT, organizations in IT, which I would call going to the dark side. Uh, if any of you are geeks, you might get that. Um, and then the last uh, seven or eight years, I've been working with nonprofit organizations. Um, I've been a volunteer actually since I was 16. So I've been a volunteer for a long time with a number of nonprofits. But then uh, about eight years ago, I left my IT career and joined a social service nonprofit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I lived um, to become a program director there. Uh, and then the last few years, I've been on a couple of different nonprofit boards. And uh, most recently, I had a couple years stint as the board chair of one nonprofit. I just finished that uh, last Thursday. Yay. Okay. That's the non board, but I'm the incoming board chair to uh, chair to another board that I serve on. So I've had the um, really blessed opportunity to see nonprofit organizations, both from the uh, staff side, which is where I actually came from more originally, and then more recently from the board side. Um, but really at heart, I'm a geek. And you can call me one, it's a four letter word, but I don't treat it that way. Uh, and I love, I really love staying in touch with technology. I wanna stay young for one thing, 
but also there's so much exciting uh, that's happening in technology. That's pretty much what I'm doing. So now um, I uh, am associated with an organization in Pittsburgh still called the Forbes Funds. I'm an executive in residence there is the job title, but basically I'm a pro bono advisor to nonprofit organizations, mostly about technology. Um, and with this AI stuff, I have to tell you, um, I just am, I'm, I'm not one of those who's rah, rah, let's do it. Okay, the good, the bad, and the scary. So I'm going to be as pragmatic as I can with you. But I am somebody who driving for 30 some hours over the last week as I relocated from Pennsylvania to Alabama through Georgia and North Carolina, long story. Um, I listened to a lot of AI podcasts and some nonprofit podcasts because I was in the car all by myself and I am kind of a geek at heart. I, I really like that stuff. There'll be more of that at the end because I'd love to connect with as many of you one-on-one -on -one as I can going forward. Okay, so today, um, certainly I wanna talk for a bit. So I hope you learned some things from me. Um, I really want to learn from you. And I'm not kidding about that. Uh, I really do. And I hope that we all learn from each other. Aretha has been really clear and TechSoup is great in setting up this forum so that those of you who are leaders in nonprofit organizations can learn from each other and from some of us who come in to talk. I'm not an expert. I'm not here to give you a lot of advice, some information, some inspiration, I hope. Um, but in about 20 minutes or less, I'd like to be done with me talking to slides and then allow you to ask questions and learn from each other as well. So I'm going to be taking notes, guys, about some of the things that you worry about or that you've tried and failed or that you've done and have succeeded. So if you were just planning to sit back for the next 50 minutes and not really be engaged, just you know, bag it, watch the video. I'm really hoping that you folks will speak up with some questions, um, probably at the end. I'm going to try to run through my materials to kind of skim things and then see what's hot with you guys for dialogue. So with that, AI, the good. So the good, the bad, and the scary. I'm going to do three slides. The good. I'm guessing most of you are familiar with a lot of this, so I'm going quickly. Uh, AI tools can help you do things faster, and so you can do things more efficiently, and your teams can be more productive. That could be ChatGPT. That could be an AI tool that helps to develop um, grant applications. There are all kinds of tools available that can make things go faster. Second is it can help you make better decisions and generate creative ideas. I'm going to use an example of uh, recipes. It's a common example in AI. Um, you can basically go and say, here's what I have that I wanna include in a dinner tonight. Um, tell me what I can make. And I've had some examples where I fixed something for my husband and I that I never would have thought of. Uh, so. You can also do, it also certainly applies to what we do as nonprofit leaders. Another good one is um, you can ex engage with your clients and your stakeholders better. There's a lot that's also been written about this, and I'd be interested to hear some good examples if some of you have tried to do things. Um, so the, having these tools allows you to personalize the way that you do outreach. Um, now, this is going to come back in the bad and the scary as well, but it, there are some really good opportunities to use these tools so that you can be better connected with those you care about and who care about you. And then the cool thing is, like a lot of stuff in this internet age, uh, a lot of these AI tools are low cost or free, and they are very easily accessible on computers, and they're getting there on phones. So for some of you, for your clients, if you're particularly in social service and your clients really only have phones, um, there are ways that they can exploit these tools as well. But I'm going to speak mostly to us who are in leadership and nonprofit organizations. And then, um, hey, AI, the good. It's going to help us cure cancer faster. It's going to solve climate change before we burn the world up and a whole bunch of other fantastic things. Just look at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the London Times or wherever you are in the world. And AI is going to change the oil in your car, diaper your baby, cure cancer. It's fantastic. Um, but, okay, but, ah, you know, there's some stuff there that's really not so good. I'm going to call this the bad. And then I'll get to the scary in a moment for, for us as nonprofit leaders. 
the really bad, 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 bad right now is what's called hallucinations. And that is an actual technical term, like AI articles written by researchers that are peer reviewed use the term hallucinations. What that is, is you ask the AI tool, whether it's BARD or ChatGPT or whatever, a question, and it gives you back what looks like a really well-packaged response. Some of it is true. Some of it is not. Now, for me, when I read hallucinations in these AI articles, I hear lie, basically, but lie suggests intent. So, but basically, the AI tool is coming back and sharing and saying something in its response that is de just dead wrong. And I don't even have to continue. Uh, this is the one big takeaway I'm going to state about my experience with AI looking at leadership of an organization like a nonprofit, which is you just can't take what it gives you without verifying. There's an analogy that a number of people have used uh, about AI, which is for non which is it's like your best intern ever. So you've got this intern who's available 24 seven, who gets things back to you fast, who bugs the crap out of you with questions like a good intern should. So you can have the AI prompt you with questions. And, you know, and, and I really enjoy um, mentoring early career folks. I really do. So I've had many interns who I've been responsible for over many years. I have three right now, in fact. And one of the things I've learned about the stuff that comes back from my interns is it's usually well-designed. So I'll get something that's packaged up in a nice PowerPoint with a good background, a good template. And a lot of it will be really good and sometimes creative. The, many of my interns have come back with ideas to me that I would not have thought of. And I love it. It's fantastic. And, you know, some other times, when I look at a slide, like they'll hit down and they'll look at a slide and I'll say, oh my gosh, where did they go off in the weeds from what I said? Because that is just dumb or wrong. AI tools can be just like that to treat whatever response you get from the software, from the AI tool as inspiration and maybe some useful information, but you've got to verify it. You've got to verify it. I'm going to say that if my intern um, came back to me, she's on a plane yesterday and today coming back from Taiwan. So if she gave me a slide deck about the, the uh, task I gave her, I would not just take that deck and go to our CEO with it. Even though it's packaged up nice, I would not because I need to go verify that what she thinks she was finding out for me is actually accurate. Okay, I'm going to move more quickly through the rest of this, but I really, really want us to acknowledge that hallucinations are bad and you must be aware of the risks if you don't validate what you get back from the AI tools. Hey, Deb. Um... Yeah. Your audio went out for a moment, so uh, would you turn off your video? Because I think we're having a problem with the audio sometimes. Uh, okay. I, I'm not sure if that it was might have... or were you speaking like that on purpose? Because it was pretty funny the way. It... No, I'm sorry, folks. Um, it was. It actually wasn't the video. It was uh, a, my phone received a phone call, and I'm using a hotspot now, so that's why. Uh, so if it happens again, Aretha, flag me, though. Okay, sure thing. Thanks. Um, in terms of bad things, um, there are ethical concerns and biases that exist uh, with current AI, particularly regarding image uh, generation and recognition. And, and there's a lot that I think we should be very sensitive in terms of what we are giving and getting with AI tools. And then another one I want to mention is that um, we could become lazy. The better AI gets, the more possible it is that we will become distant from our stakeholders, become distant from our clients, um, become actually lose the value you get from just slodging through and doing something and being wrong. Um, and so we, we could become kind of lazy. And that's something that over time, it would be very interesting, I think, to see. But it's something as leaders that we should be watching from in our staff. So development is probably the front edge of using AI. 
And if all of a sudden the annual report and the monthly newsletters and whatever it else is going out is just seeming like it's sort of bland, um, it could be that our development team is depending a little bit too much on what they're getting from the AI tools. And they're really not putting their heart and their minds into creating the kind of content that will reach the people we need to reach with the information that's important. So I'm calling that bad, not scary yet. I'm getting to scary in a moment. And then there's all kinds of other bad stuff about AI you can read in the news, but I wanna get to scary. So the scary thing, here's where you could actually lose your job. Here's where you could do something horrible, 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 or someone on your team could. So hallucinations, that's kind of bad, right? But the scary part is if you or someone on your team takes sensitive information that you have protected for all these years and your IT has, team has helped you to be protecting for all these years, and then because it's kind of easy to upload a PDF file or a spreadsheet to the AI, somebody on your team does that and then exposes protected information, that's really bad. And I am a geek, I'm an IT guy, so I worry, about, I'm, I'm the bearer of bad news. You know, we wanna run fast and I'm one of those people who has to say, oh, wait, wait, um, how about HIPAA? Or how about, you know, the donor information that's in our donor database? Yeah, you can dump it out to a spreadsheet on your computer, that's within our IT policy, but you can't upload it to some AI tool to analyze for you just because it's easy and free, but it's really tempting. I have this one in yellow because to me, this is for nonprofit leaders. Um, probably the scariest thing, the, the thing, the topic that you should be most aware of, informed about, and working with your team to internalize in the organization because it's so doggone easy. That example I just gave, download a spreadsheet from your donor database, upload it to some AI tool and ask the AI tool to recommend who you should go after for money next. That is so compelling, but you don't wanna do that unless you fully, fully understand what's going to happen with that data that you just uploaded to the internet. Um, okay, I'm going to mention displacing jobs. Uh, there's a lot that's being written about that. That actually to me is a bit scary in terms of the future of uh, our society, but also it could be an opportunity. Um, so you might want to think about understanding more about what a, I could do for your organization pragmatically as you build your future staffing and budget plan. And then the last I'm going to mention is what's called the black box effect. It's kind of the cousin of the slide earlier where I mentioned that we might lose touch, we might become lazy. Well, the black box effect is similar to that, which is basically saying, that even the advanced researchers who are creating the AI tools do not fully understand how the results are being generated and can't validate the sources of information. And that's scary. It's okay if I don't know how, how Google serves up to me a bunch of results when I do a search, but I'm counting on the guys at Google knowing how that works. So there's a bit of trust there. With AI, it's not there yet. And that comes into a lot of the regulations that are being looked at in the EU and the US that we really don't wanna get into today. Um, and then just because it's a slide with the title AI the scary, I have to acknowledge that there is the whole stuff that's in again, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times about AI robots may cause us all to be extinct. Um, there's a lot written about that, but that's way out of our concern. Uh, Hopefully it won't happen. If so, I guess we won't remember much about this talk. Okay, now, last thing I wanna talk about is how can you get started? Because I really wanted to get to dialogue where you can ask questions about topics I've thrown out here, um, or we can have a conversation among folks. Um, so I have three slides about what I recommend you do to get going. If, you and if you're already there, I want feedback and thoughts about who who's doing what. So. First of all, um, there's a topic that's very prominent for nonprofit organizations and small businesses that is uh, creating an AI acceptable use policy. And I think that this is something that if you aren't already working on, you should. Even if you don't wanna start with AI or do anything with it for a while, 
uh, get the wheels rolling to create a policy. And um, I have some recommendations here about doing it. Um, I think that leadership and boards, both, uh, and being now kind of a board guy, no longer being employed by a nonprofit, I have a new lens, but um, there could be value in having the right board members involved. Um, but this is something that needs to be coming from the top in the organization, like a lot of good things must come from the top and yet not be a mandate. It needs, I really believe firmly, this needs to be something that you and your leadership team work on together and that it's, there's buy-in and so adoption will be really good throughout your organization. Hallucinations happen, so you don't want your team going off and ignoring that. And you don't want protected data hitting the internet where it shouldn't. Also, um, I think AI literacy is something that should be embedded into your organization starting now, starting as soon as you can. Um, you can, if you're already on that uh, path, I'm interested to, for you to share your experiences. That's what ED Chat's about. Um, I'll mention that uh, something like a monthly AI lunch and learn uh, could be easy to do. Uh, and then that acceptable use policy, uh, if you have a monthly lunch and learn and somebody from finance says, hey, and by the way, we did this, then hopefully your leadership, somebody at the lunch and learn could point out that maybe they skipped the guide rails and shouldn't have done it. And that's okay. That's how we learn. Um, but that policy is crucial. And then find a way that that policy is not just off on the shelf, but it's something that your organization lives. And then uh, the third I'm going to talk about a little bit more here is I recommend that you build and review an AI roadmap for your organization. And you include progress reports, reports and make AI, I, I'm sounding like such a geek and I am, but the possibilities are really fantastic and the risks are really real, are very real. So um, of all the thousands of things that you ED CEOs could put onto your staff agenda or could worry about, um, or look to exploit. Um, I really do think AI is a tech thing that is worth it. So I suggest that you create an AI roadmap. And for your AI roadmap, I have an, an idea of how to approach it. And I made this up. If you Google it and there's something out there, they stole my idea. Um, but basically it's the Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare, but I'm expanding it a bit to say, we've got the hare, we've got the tortoise and we've got the ostrich. And I am asserting today that all three perspectives could be valid at different times. And it's not something that is good or bad. It's what makes the most sense. And it's a nice quick way for you and your leadership team to identify what you're going to do in your roadmap. And I have another slide with a quick example, but let me introduce the hare, the tortoise and the ostrich. Uh, so the hare, and Aesop's fable kind of falls apart here a little bit, um, but I kind of like the imagery. So uh, the hare, if you're ready in some area to move forward with AI, and some of you are already hares, I'm sure in some areas, um, then identify projects and take them forward responsibly. So that means we're going to try to use AI to make things better. In doing so, we're going to be responsible and pragmatic. We'll have objectives, we'll have a timeline, we'll be sure that we can resource it, et cetera. It's a project. The tortoise, on the other hand, areas of your organization where you're not quite ready to leap, like a hare, but you wanna move forward. So pick a pilot project maybe, do some research, study it, talk about it, be really deliberate before you even take a step with a mouse in hand. Um, and then the ostrich, I think this also absolutely can apply to parts of your organization. But again, I'm going to suggest you be forthright about this with your leadership team to say, hey, in this area, we're going to be ostriches. We're going to stick our heads in the sand and hope our butts don't get burned by what's going on with AI until it's really shaken out. Um, by the way, these photos, these images, um, the first two I generated on Dolly, which is one of these AI things. I asked the tortoise, I asked Dali to do uh, image impressionist style of a tortoise in the model of the uh, thinker statue. And I really, that was really good. Okay, so just about to finish up here, um, AI roadmap, this is an example. And so I just wanna point out that the way I would approach this if I were running a nonprofit would be to start with something like this with my leadership team. 
that says in different areas where we could explore or add AI to how we do things, what are we going to do this quarter? What are we going to do next quarter? And then some comments on why. And you could expand this a lot. I tried to just make something for one slide. But leadership, you start, for those of you who are at the top, man, start now. You're the hair. You're going to do this. You're going to make it happen. And you're going to embed it in your organization. No excuses. That, that doesn't mean you're doing anything with AI. It means you and your organization will understand the good, the bad, and the scary of AI. But then in development, maybe for events, you are the hair this quarter, you try an event or two where you use AI in a deliberate fashion. But then next quarter, you say, you know what, we're going to plan that the next quarter, we're going to do things the old way and just really reflect on how things went. But on the other hand, communication might be, we're going to be the tortoise this quarter. We're going to understand what these tools can do for us, mess around with them some, understand where we could screw up. And then next quarter, we're going for it. We're going to be the hair. So we're going to use AI tools to help us with our communications, et cetera. Now, actually, I did want to mention finance. Um, if anybody has an organization where finance or anything in finance is going to be the hair, I want to hear about it, please, because that's the one place that like I put ostrich here for the next two quarters, basically being anything having to do with finance scares me. And if there's still a scary stuff in AI, I think I'd want to wait. But I might be wrong. I, I Actually, there, there might be good examples of where areas of finance could move forward. So what I recommend is that you build this with your leadership team and update it regularly. And it gives you a way to debate how much you want to go forward and how much of your resources you want to put into pursuing AI stuff. OK, discussion topics. Um, we could talk about what areas could be hairs you want to run for, what successes have you guys already had or setbacks, what concerns do you have, uh, what areas like finance I'm suggesting might be ostriches and why. And then I want to mention something about adoption in your organization, uh, which is what can you do to engage your internal champions inside your organization, including your board or other key stakeholders? And what do you do about your internal blockers? This is always a question that should be on the forefront when you're going to make some change in your organization. So with that, um, I wanna make one final offer. Here's my uh, email account, but also um, I'm really trying to learn as much as I can about this. I've talked with about a dozen uh, EDs or directors of operations, a um, couple of other roles in some small nonprofit organizations. I'm doing a couple of little projects, uh, pro bono projects for some uh, some of my friends uh, in nonprofits. But I really personally want to learn more. And so if you're interested in chatting with me more one-on-one -on -one later, um, book some time with me on my calendar, half an hour, hour, whenever you want. It could be August, it could be September, it could be tomorrow. Um, and with that, though, I'd like to uh, do what we're supposed to do with ED chat, which is to say, okay, guys, what questions and topics and experiences do you have to share so you can all learn from each other? So Aretha, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Awesome. This was so awesome. So many great points, so many things that I took away from this. I'm going to go to the Q&A section. I know you may have a question. Deb, if you can... Um, take your screen down so we can see the faces of people. I'm gonna go to Q&A because they were the first ones to ask questions. And then if you have a question, use the raise your hand option. I see some snaps, I see some people clapping. Yes, I'll give her a virtual clap and some snaps in the chat. So awesome. So here in the Q&A, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Zelda says, has anyone drafted a company policy on the use and restrictions of use of AI that they would be prepared to share? So has anybody done that? Um, use the raise your hand option, you can do that. Or Deb, um, there was another question that kind of ties into what she said from Faith. It said, could you please share an example of an AI acceptable use policy written by a human preferably? Hey, I have a quick comment on that, Aretha, which is I think that might be a great topic for an ED chat or another session. So um, there, there was the class that TechSoup sponsored in uh, May and June, and I see a couple names here of folks who were there. The AI use policy came up there, and um, at that 
in that group, basically it was acknowledged that there are lots of examples. If you just go out to the internet and then look, um, there, there might be, I haven't looked recently, there might be some better ones on one of the like boardable or one of the nonprofit oriented organizations. Um, so there are lots if you look, uh, and I think it's one that everybody should do. And so basically my inspiration today is do one. Uh, and then Aretha, if TechSoup, if we wanna help, I think we could. Absolutely. And um, Joshua, I see you in the chat. You put a link in here to a Google Doc with the sample AI policy. I would love, I'm looking over here because I'm looking at the chat. So I need to be looking at you. I would love if you know you would like to come and 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 kind of do an ED chat on that, explain more what should be in the policy and why and who. And so um send me an email at asimons at techsoup.org and that's for anybody who would like to be a feature speaker. I would love to put my email in the chat as well. Um, you definitely want to come to next month's ED chat because um, we have somebody from Grantable that's going to be here. But let's get back to the Q&A. Uh, Tia says, we will be forced to use AI regardless to how we feel about it. This is a question. She has a question mark on there. Uh, so what do you think? Do you think we're going to be forced to use it regardless of how we feel about it? What do you think, Deb? No, but resistance is futile. I, love um, I, I don't actually, let me step back. I think it's possible that one, two, three, five years from now, which is a really long time, the way that AI, the way this AI stuff is changing. I think it's very possible that organization, nonprofit organizations that uh, could still be thriving without using AI. I really do. Um, because there's so much need, basically, because there's so much need. However, um, I think it would be crazy to be one of those, uh, the, the AI Luddite, three, five years from now. I don't think that we'll be forced to use it though. I was at a, I was at a nonprofit in Pittsburgh uh, about a year ago and they didn't have Wi-Fi. So let me give that as an example. So they were getting cables and my laptop doesn't have an ethernet connector. And so they had to go. So basically this organization has existed for 27 years. And over the last 10 or 15, when everybody I thought had Wi-Fi, they don't have it. Um, and they're thriving because they do good work for the community and the constituents they need to serve. That's powerful. That's, I'm glad you shared that. Steve and Pam Chapman, will we get the presentation to share with our staff? Absolutely. We're gonna email you this video replay and the slides by tomorrow. So you'll get that by tomorrow. And Reverend oh, Tracy, Aretha. yes. If I could add one thing, um, so the slide deck, at the end of the deck, there are two or three slides I put in with just some additional information. I knew I wouldn't have time to talk to it. Uh, and so please feel free to use that as you'd like as well. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely send all your, your entire slides. So thank you, your slides were awesome. Reverend Tracy asked, does AI pick up information that is dominating the market in the moment? Hallucination seems a little scary, like misinformation. What are your thoughts on that? I think it does. But I like to hear absolutely. You. Yes, and there's a there's a lot about why how AI how these AI works how these AI tools work that explains why they quote unquote hallucinate. Um, and my advice I'll stick with is um, be aware of it. Don't let it be an excuse for not using tools in a responsible way. Um, but I, I think for from from what I've read and from the research that's out there about these generative AI tools, which is what we're talking about here, um, it's likely that those hallucinations or lies or incorrect information, it's likely that will continue for a while. Um, but so be aware of it and then deal with it. That that I didn't mean to sound harsh there, but um, I've talked to a number of uh, EDs as I've been scanning folks over the last four months so recently, but I talked to a number who said, ah, I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to go there because it lies. It's wrong. I don't go there. And I really am hoping that we can overcome that fear. 
Okay, Gail Sampson, um, our Chief Development Officer, if you're still here, would you unmute yourself? And while she's doing that, Deb, would you put your link into the chat that you wanted people to contact you? Um, yeah, Gail, sure, okay. I'd be happy to do that. Hi, everybody, I'm Gail Carpentier. I've had the fun of working with Aretha for a long time, and I've just celebrated, Lord, a 22nd year working with TechSoup as their Chief Business Development Officer. So a pretty big chunk of the stuff you see in our marketplace or companies I've had the fun of working with. And uh, I'm gonna put a link in here uh, of a, our technology wish list. But if what I'm looking for, since this is a burgeoning area of our uh, industry, and I tend to agree with you, Deb, that uh, maybe it's not gonna be forced to us, but who thought that we were gonna need to use Google every day either, you know? So things change. And what I'm looking for are what tools, what resources would help you do your work better, help your organization to be stronger that you're not currently finding on TechSoup. So if you can help me know what's useful, uh, uh, what's going to be helpful, what have we not started bringing your way, uh, please let me know. I'm also going to add my direct email here. So if you guys just feel more comfortable writing me directly, feel free to reach me there too. So Aretha, that's everything I wanted to say. Anything else I can help with? Awesome, that was great. And, and Gail means anything. So I've know people use uh, giving platforms that we don't have, let Gail know and probably she can bring it on to TechSoup platforms so you can get at a discount. So thank yeah, you so and, and there are sometimes people I'm working with as uh, you know strategic uh, advisors I'm working with one company that is actually actively looking at how to use AI to help your grant proposals be stronger still early days, but, you know, so those are things that, you know, and also if there are things that you think I should know about that maybe it's not uh, solid enough to be part of the TechSoup marketplace, but you think that it's really interesting and cool and I should be getting a chance to follow those people, please uh, send them my way as well. Awesome. Thank that you for letting me pop in. Take oh, care. Thank you. thank you. Now that partner you were just talking about, this, their name start with a G. I don't know if you get that top secret information away yet. I believe it does come to okay. think of it. And I believe you may have mentioned their name earlier, but okay. uh, yeah. awesome. all right, guys, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Well, you definitely want to be at ED chat next month. So there's some questions in the Q and A. Um, Deb, I'm going to keep tossing them to you. Um, beginning experience says some of us are sole employees who are overwhelmed with the work of the mission. As a non-geek, how do I try to incorporate AI into my work to be more useful versus a time sink, I guess, you know, sinking time into it. Yeah, and um, that's a really tough question. Um, so the nonprofits that I have worked with and three of the four boards I'm on are all fewer than five staff. So I kind of feel your pain. I'm going to say, hey, does anybody else have a thought on that? Because I don't have a real great answer. I have a long winded one. <laughs> Anybody want to um, use the raise your hand option to unmute yourself to answer that question? Because I know a lot of people are new nonprofits and you may be in the same boat um, as this organization. Anyone? Okay, so we're going to move on for the sake of time. Um, Tia says, will there be a document? Oh, to show Joshua has one. I was hoping he I might. See I want to finish this question. Will there be a document to show those of us who signed on late to answer the questions that were already answered live? no document so that's why i read the questions out loud so that you'll know why the person answered that way so um, we hope you can gain some more insight after watching the replay as well uh josh want to unmute yourself yeah sure and and hey, deb so great to see you presenting on this topic that's fantastic um so uh on being productive even if you're just one person um, there's there's something we wrote about a, a while ago called this like square wheel paradox. There's there's an article about it about it's like people with a cart of rocks and you're like trying to get work done and someone's holding round wheels and you've got square wheels and you're like I'm too busy I can't do it. I encourage you to think of some level of AI learning as that. Yes, it's it's overwhelming because you got so much else on your plate, but even just an hour learning how to use basic like. GPT to generate drafts of documents, or if you want to go one step further, um, there's something called Code Interpreter now, which can do really spectacular things with data analysis. And basically, if you're a single person, 
gives you the ability to have like a fairly sophisticated data analyst to like make charts for you. And you can ask plain English questions about data sets. And you could learn, really any person could learn this within an hour. And so it's it's worth that little bit of investment, even if you're a one person nonprofit. So that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you so much for that. Um, someone from this organization, I don't want to mispronounce it, but the last name is Africa. We're impacting communities in 10 countries. That's awesome. Congratulations, by the way, where the internet is non-existent. Can we introduce AI there offline? Very good question. I'll okay. respond with two comments and then I'm curious if anyone else has thoughts. The first is that um, most of the uh, discussion of using AI for non organizations has been uh, for staff and internal operations. Little has been for clients. Um, and I think that's an area that we in the nonprofit world can explore. How can we help our help other humans whom we serve to live their lives better or whatever through using some of these technologies? Now, if what you're talking about is you have staff in other countries where internet isn't available, uh, it's very difficult. There are tools on cell phones. So I know many, um, I, I'm very familiar that in many parts of the world, uh, cell phones are available and data plans are less expensive than we're accustomed to here in the US. Um, there are tools that are available through phones, uh, ChatGPT, for example, there's an app for ChatGPT and there are lots more apps. Um, but uh, if you are, okay, so you have 6,000 volunteers in Africa, yeah. So, um, I think that, that there's not a quick answer to that, but if they have access to the internet through their phones, uh, then it's very possible that they could take advantage of these tools if you have a good plan for what we want them to use. That's a good answer. And maybe um, Lashie, can, can we connect them with someone from NGO Source? Maybe they can answer that better. Uh, Larry says, what is the best way to feed, quote unquote, or train a chatbot to understand the voice or the lingo of my organization so that the content it generates is in alignment with our internal language? Great question. Yeah, so first I'm going to say two things to that briefly. One is um, training a chatbot to do work for you is something I didn't go into in any detail, but um, it is a really cool tool and you can use it both internally and externally. So you can basically feed a bunch of PDFs into a chatbot and then have the chatbot be able to answer questions. And I mentioned training, that's a great opportunity there. Um, I'm not answering your question yet. I just wanna set a little context for how chatbots could be useful because I didn't cover it. So chatbot could be useful internally for people to, particularly for training, uh, for people to understand what your policies are or understand how your organization works. Chatbots also can be added, for example, to your website so that you can have a more, one of those typical customer service type of dialogues with folks. Now, in answer to your question, um, there are a lot of, there been a, there's been a lot of research and articles written in this area. I don't know enough to uh, synthesize it. So I'm setting up that, hey, why would you care, everybody? And it's because, hey, these chatbots can be really cool, um, like internally for training. Um, but does anyone here know the answer to the actual question? which is how could you train a chatbot to be um, more in the voice of your organization? Because I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I you'd love have, to. You'd Go have ahead. to use their application programming interface for that, their API. Um, I've seen folks do it with training um, specific subject matter and they would set the sources. So you could take say 100,000 websites and do it that way. Um, but you need uh, an AI, uh, ML, machine learning person like my colleague. Awesome. And Ali, um, maybe you can answer this part. This part of Rachel asked this question is similar to what the last question was. What are some of the tips and tricks for working with AI to produce responses close to what you need? For example, she said, I asked ChatGPT to highlight redundancies or I tell it to condense text into three sentences. 
What are your yes. thoughts on that? Certainly, I like Grammarly Go Beta, which uh, has prompts that you could do stuff like that much better than the chat interface that ChatGPT has. Uh, GPT itself is a large language model and it's more so evolving into a reasoning system uh, than a chatbot, just one clarification there. Um, so it could help you reason with like those redundancy things that you talked about. Things I use it for is research synthesis and uh, things of that nature. Um, it, it's, it's great for things that need to be done over and over, but also for seeing things that you may miss. Uh, it's, it's been super helpful and useful in many ways too. Awesome. I saw a couple of hands up and then they disappeared. So if you still wanted to make a comment, um, feel free to use a raise your hand option. Oh, Josh, and then Kristen after that. Yeah, I just want to say very quick, um, uh, just like five days ago um, for the paid chat GPT and the code interpreter tool I mentioned earlier, it's also on the paid $20 a month um, chat GPT plus, but they allow custom instructions, which is a no code like just create instructions that are persistent with your chat GPT that can include your voice, your audience, what you want. So that no longer has to be something. So it's not quite the same as training your own with huge amounts of your organization's data, but it's a like literally five, 10 minute way of having a personalized chatbot that could create content for you in the tone of your writing, your organization. So I just want to share that with you. Oh, okay. Um, Kristen, did you still want to make a comment? Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure because I don't have like applied, you know, experience, but I've just been going down the rabbit hole in terms of a lot of um, different conferences and people and business use cases. And I think it was the response to um, someone saying training it in your voice. So I watched like a full kind of one hour, uh, piece on someone doing this. Basically, if you kind of Googled in how to, you know, train chat, chat GPT on your brand voice. So basically it can't take large amounts of, of text, but you can, you can kind of chunk it out. So you could take your website, you could take your copy, um, anything that you've put out in your newsletter, your social media, and then start to train chat GPT on that and then keep it in one thread and just say, you know, you always talk, talking to chat GPT and saying, pretend you're, you know, you're this person, pretend I'm the copywriter, pretend I'm the author of, or I'm the CEO of this organization and basically taking it through. And, I'll, and one thing they noted was always to remind it because chat GPT can forget. So always refresh them, go copy and paste on that thread, go back and bring it back. And you're basically training them in that voice. You have one consistent thread. So as you're asking it to create your copy over time, it will, you know, develop your voice. You just need to create, give it more and more data as you go along. And so, yeah, it's just an insight that I got from a, from a workshop. I don't have any hands on yet, but I just want to share that. Thanks. That was, that was great insight because I'm asking chat GPT from stuff about Home Depot and then I'll skip to something else. And so I'm not, it's, it's chat GPT. I'm not training it in my voice because it's all over the place. So that was good. Hi, Joel. You can unmute yourself. Yes, I, uh, I, I've written several articles. And uh, so I said, well, I will try chat GVT and have it do an, a su summary of one of the articles. And it summarized it. I said, well, that's nice, but it does not, it didn't quite to me give the personalized feeling that I had in that article. It was an experience that I had. Right. Uh, and so I uh, did something else and I took a email that I had written to, uh, we have a seminar coming up and, and several people had pre-registered pre for the seminar. We had to move classroom speakers around so they were double booked now. And so we had, I, I wrote an email saying, you we're gonna cancel your, your registration because you can't attend two classes at the same time. So I said, what, what are you gonna do? And chat GBT came back and gave a long dissertation all about, well, thank you for being a member of the, and, and your interest in this, and and thank you for that, and thank you for this, and we appreciate, and so forth. And I said, make it more, per, uh, less 
less formal and more personal. And it came up with a phenomenal thing in which it said, whoopee, we, we found an error in our thing and you know, it went on that type of approach to it. So my point being is dig into it and just remember, remember that chat G, GBT is a, uh, a foreign professor that's helping you all the time. Oh, that's good. And so you you keep asking your this person, how can you help me improve? How can you do something for me? And think of it that way. I like that. I like that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. That was good. Hi. Uh, there are a few tools. Unfortunately, I wasn't prepared to, I cannot find them right away, but there are somewhere in my uh, big collection of AI tools. Uh, there are tools when you can uh, use ChatGPT for your own domain. So you basically can add uh, either domain address or URLs or, uh, you know, customize ChatGPT so it won't give you like wrong answers or go somewhere where you don't want it to go. So um, I, I'll i send it to you, uh, I mean, to either Gail or to you uh, in direct mail. And uh, actually um, I have a, quite an experience of uh, working with different AI tools, uh, various including like visualization tools and summarization and not only chat GPT, but uh, really various because I, I'm a researcher for innovation teams. So, and uh, um, a lot of customers just want us to use chat GPT for ideation, like how we can uh, use chat GPT to innovate. Like we, we are working on drones and we want to enter a market of uh, say food market. So, and one of the um, things that we did was like um, we cross pollinated several concepts and uh, it always works. So there is a re recipe for that. I put a link in the chat, so I encourage everyone to watch this Judiciary Committee hearing about copyright and AI. And uh, it's really funny, it's not boring. So uh, really take your time, watch a little bit, and it's, it's plain English and you'll get an understanding of how harmful it could be if you let it do what basically eat once or uh, use it uh, without your control. And I totally agree with Deb about uh, AI policy. It should be uh, drafted, it should be implemented and there should be a certain level of uh, AI uh, education in every organization. So uh, I, again, I'll write it to, to you directly, but I think that I may well, um, volunteer to start a little bit of AI newsletters because uh, I mean it's it's a huge it's a huge environment and what actually what we're talking about today is not AI it's generative AI and mostly text LLMs except for DALI but uh, mostly I, I see people in the chat they're talking about uh, text generation and working with text so um and it's really hard to you know to navigate in this uh, ocean of uh, tools and some of the startups they are there today and they're running out of business tomorrow and some of them want you to pay money like upfront uh, although there are free tools they're reliable tools there i would encourage everyone to uh, just use one tool like one function tool say if you if you like to get something summarized then say try being it's safe because sometimes uh, I mean what's the biggest problem with uh, chat GPT is we don't know where it gives uh, where it gets the answers from so we don't we have no idea how it was trained we have no idea what documents were 
input. Besides ChatGPT, uh, only provides us with information up to 2021. So, and um, again, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. See, I told you this is what ED chat is about for all of us to chat and have conversations and have our voices heard. That was awesome, great information. And I hope your newsletter is a success if you decide to do that. So I'm gonna go um, to the Q&A. We, we're gonna just take one more question. I know lots of people put them in the Q&A, but this one's really important to me because I don't, Katie, I don't want you to um, leave and feel like I didn't get what I needed. And I'm sure a lot of you may um, feel that way if we didn't get to your question, but uh, it wasn't Katie. Katie, I'm gonna roll your question into Teams question as well. Um, Katie asks, what AI tools are available to create charts and graphs based on the data you put? So this question ties into Tina's. Tina said, would you be able to send a list of different AI platforms that were mentioned? I cannot send the list because that would mean that TechSoup is endorsing them and we're not, I'm not, we're not, I'm not here to say that we agree with any of them or we're against any of them. So for all of you who are on here, go ahead and type in the chat which um, uh, AI tool that you use, chat, GPT, bar, whichever one you use, and also the one for um, making graphs so that uh, Tina can, can look at that and see that. Uh, I want to uh, say thank you so much to Deb. Deb, that was an awesome presentation. I mean, I learned so much, the tortoise, the hare, and the ostrich, right? You guys are gonna be able to watch that on the replay. Thank you for everybody who had input. I wanted to leave some close remarks for Deb if you want to say anything. I don't see you on my screen anymore. Nope, nope. I thank you too, Aretha, for the opportunity. And I can't wait to read all the stuff in the chat. Yes. And when you uh, step away from this webinar, you're going to have a um, survey. Please fill out the survey. Deb, I want you to come back and do this again. So be thinking of topics. If anybody else would like to be a um, featured speaker, please email me at asimons at techsoup.org. Thank you, Gail uh, Carpentier, for being um, in the chat and Lashika so much for your input in the chat. This was great. Lots of thank yous to you, Deb. So thank you to all your nonprofits for all that you do. Have a great rest of your week and take care of yourself as you're taking care of others. Bye-bye.